Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In hell, Lord, he was in torment, the rich man looked up and said, Have pity on me and send the Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, it was thrown into the lake of fire. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolater, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of the burning soul. And in today's gospel, it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. As a general rule, we Anglicans don't particularly care to talk about it hell. <laughs> but there it is. And these are just a few New Testament verses which talk of the reality of hell. And Jesus talked about it more than anyone else. I can tell you, as someone who has to preach from time to time, it's much more pleasant to preach about heaven than about hell. And it's, it's a natural thing. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like hearing about it. We don't even like thinking about it. And that's not unique to anything about it. A poll was done by a group called the Barna Polling Group that 76% of Americans believe there is a specific place of joy and bliss that lasts for eternity called heaven. But only 32% believe that there is an eternal place of suffering known as hell. Probably the only thing we like talking about less than hell is maybe death. So, why did you pick, Lloyd, such an uncomfortable subject to preach on? Well, had it been left up to me, I would not have. But our Lord did. So I must. You know, he and I are on our third Toyota Prius. And I think the person we bought was back in 2011, maybe 12, but just a few years earlier, I think it was in 2009, uh, Toyota Priuses were just going by. I mean, you would be driving along and they'd be hit and would just take off and accelerate and run into stuff and hurt people and kill people. So I was a firm for my first purchase of Toyota Prius. Toyota, as any good PR narrative would go, dismissed this, claiming that it was probably isolated incidents where the driver meant to push the brake, but mistakenly pushed the accelerator. But as some time went by, and more and more of these incidents began to pile up. More and more people were getting hurt. So were kids. There was a lot of public outlook, particularly among previous owners. But this outrage did not come because Toyota engines had a flaw, but because it was found out that Toyota had known about this for a long time, warned no one, and said nothing. Now the CEO of Toyota, to his credit, in testimony before a house committee, owned up to it, took his loans, and saw to it that the problem was fixed. But what if? What if he had stepped before that committee and defended himself and his company by saying, oh yeah, we knew, we knew about all that for a long time, 
we didn't warn anyone because that would not have been a very caring thing to do. That would have upset our customers. Jesus' warnings about hell to the moral and sinful are not acts of malice meant to scare them, but an act of love meant to save them from it. Jesus used the Greek word Gehenna when he spoke of hell. Gehenna was just a Hellenized version of a Hebrew place called the Valley of Gehenna. There's a valley southwest of Jerusalem where in ancient times pagan was sacrificed their children to the pagan god Moloch. And there was a time in history when the Israelites joined in with them. It's a little small valley where criminals and unclaimed bodies were discarded and were stacked. Some of them were burned. They were stacked to decay and rot and be eaten by one. It was a literal garbage dump. Stench of it would travel for miles around. It was a place so repugnant to the Jewish mind that in the Gihanon Valley of this day, no Israeli would think of living there or building there. And I believe that Jesus used this term Gehenna or hell to impress on the Jewish mind that if you think the geographical place, the valley of Gihanon, is bad. You can't imagine how many times past that eternal hell will be. Now, we just rather really not discuss hell. I know I'd rather not. In fact, when I saw the gospel reading for today, I had a strong urge to preach on the psalm <laughs> or the James epistle. I give serious consideration to preaching on the gospel of the day anything but this gospel. Because we don't like contemplating hell. You know what? We can try to live our Christian lives without discussing or thinking about hell. I know what maybe we can just ignore its reality. We can do that, but you know what? It would require us to make some changes. For instance, we probably need to stop referring to Jesus Christ our Savior. Because without the reality of hell, what are we being saved from? Now, another change we have to make, we have to get us another book, or at least remove huge portions of what Jesus said, because he talked more about hell than anyone. Last Sunday, Jesus used a child to teach about humility. And these children were still around in this teaching. This is all in the flow of continuous teaching by the Lord. So Jesus points out one of these little children, and he said, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, two thoughts I have on those words of one. One is, the quickest way to find out about the reality of hell is unrepentant abuse of a child. Mental abuse, physical abuse, or as Jesus teaches us this morning, even leading a child astray from his innocent or her innocent little journey to the world is abuse. The second thing that I think about when I read this verse is that Jesus is not pointing out this terrible punishment due to a person who would do this. In fact, he's doing the opposite. He's saying that it would be a blessing to someone to be weighted down and thrown into the sea compared to being eternally separated from God in hell. 
Jesus' descriptions of hell should scare the fire out of us, no pun intended. Except for one thing. We're not going to Jesus Christ is our Savior. Jesus Christ has saved us from it. So, instead of fear, we should feel love for Him and gratitude to Him. Because if there's one thing Jesus makes clearer than the reality of hell, it is that believers will never experience it. And this is the will of Him who sent me, said the Lord, that I shall lose none of all those He has given me, but shall raise Him up at the last day. Now to avoid redundancy this morning, I'm going to ask all of you to consider the comfortable words when we get to them as part of the sermon. And may we all, particularly the one speaking, be able to shift out of our rote mode that we can get into and really hear the comfortable word. Because if we do, we'll understand why they're called the comfortable word. Then why, Lord, if believers are not going there, do you need to make us all aware of this uncomfortable reality? of hell and eternal separation from God. I mean, it's such a frightening, uncomfortable, bad news subject. Well, so that it increases our sense of urgency in getting the good news to the lost and dying world around us so that they too may never experience it. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's very last words to us show that that was his greatest concern. May it be ours also. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost.